Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, events. Uh, my name is uh, Kevin Featherstone, and I'm the current director of the Hellenic Observatory here at the school. Uh, tonight's public event is part of the program for the Hellenic Observatory, and we're very pleased to uh, welcome our speaker this evening, Stefanos Kazalakis, the leader of the opposition and the leader of uh, Syriza uh, in Greece. Over the last 30 years, I uh, would like to uh, highlight, uh, here at the LSC, we've hosted practically every prime minister, every leader of the opposition, every minister of finance, almost every minister, uh, minister of foreign affairs. So we didn't want to miss the opportunity of inviting uh, Stefanos Kazalakis uh, to speak to us uh, here uh, this evening. Now, for a number of you who know uh, about Greek politics, uh, and for others as well, uh, you may think uh, the story of our speaker here tonight is rather like an intriguing Hollywood movie. Uh, we're coming up to the Oscars, and I think this story would uh, appeal uh, to many uh, people. A young Greek living in America with practically no previous political experience stands in an open contest for leadership of the party and wins. The young, handsome newcomer Where's he? Uh, de de defeats long-term party stalwarts uh, for the leadership. In his political career, professional career, sorry, in his pro professional career, he's worked for Goldman Sachs as a commodities uh, um, trader. Uh, yet he leads a political party which in its past has had neo-Marxist roots, at least in part. And he's the first openly gay uh, party leader uh, in Greece. And we're delighted that his partner, Tyler Macbeth, is with us here. This be, I think he deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Kevin, it's his husband, because we worked very hard for that to be legal in Greece. Oh, OK. Oh, yes, indeed, indeed. You were about 10 seconds ahead of me, because I was going to invite you to applaud the decision of the Greek parliament last Thursday in legalizing uh, same-sex marriage uh, in Greece. Um, applause, please. <laughs> So it's a story of contrasts with very few uh, precedents. Now, uh, some of you are here, and I look particularly at uh, the media who are here, of course, uh, are particularly interested because our, our speaker is in the middle of some political storm in this last couple of days. Uh, and so uh, we're delighted that he has maintained uh, the commitment to come and speak to us here uh, at the LSC. Many of, the, you, many of you then, and certainly for a foreign audience, are very keen to learn more about him, about his political beliefs, political experience, political identity. But we're also going to be addressing, at least indirectly, a much bigger political uh, question. How does a party of the centre-left or left I'm not prejudging anything at the moment. Um, how does a political party that has faced uh, two rather major election defeats uh, adapt, change its strategy in order to win uh, power? It's a question which uh, many uh, left or centre-left politicians across Europe will, uh, are asking in these uh, times. The left is weaker today uh, in France, in Sweden, in Italy, than many of us uh, can remember. And of course, in the UK, the Labour Party has made its own uh, shift from Jeremy Corbyn to Keir Starmer. So there's much interest for us to discuss things uh, this evening, both in a personal fashion and in terms of strategy 
and uh, how to get the left uh, back into uh, power. Uh, so uh, let me uh, mention that a number of people are watching tonight on live stream, uh, and we hope to upload a recording. It's very important not to panic. <laughs> We hope to uh, upload a recording of tonight's uh, event onto our website for the Hellenic Observatory at the LSE, and so I'm sure many people will be downloading that uh, as well. So people are watching uh, with the uh, online live stream, but they're also watching on YouTube uh, as well. Kai suggests that if you wish to uh, comment using uh, social media, X, previously known as Twitter, then um, uh, please use the, we suggest you use the hashtag, hashtag LSE Greece. There's nothing too original about that. And as we heard before, can I ask you to uh, put your mobile phones to silent uh, so we don't have uh, interruptions uh, in that uh, fashion. The format for this evening is that in a moment I'm going to um, be in conversation with uh, Stephanos Kazalakis, and then later we'll allow uh, time, plenty of time, for you, the audience, to uh, ask uh, questions. If you are watching online, you can send us questions using the relevant icon on your screen, and I'm being given um, some iPad so that I can then relay those questions uh, to uh, our speaker. So, good, good job with a product placement for Apple. <laughs> so, without further ado, can I please ask you to give a welcome to our speaker this evening, Stefanos Kazalak. So, uh, first of all, welcome, and uh, thanks for maintaining uh, this event. I think the, this probably belongs to me. This tablet, yes. This tablet. Uh, that's, for, that's for later. Um, so, yes, I'd like to ask uh, questions perhaps in two parts, if I may, uh, uh, The first part, I'm going to be asking questions which help to identify you politically, who you are politically because there's a lot of interest. And then, uh, secondly, questions about strategy for Syriza, your policies, how you would like to change the party and indeed uh, regain power uh, in Greece, if that's, uh, that's okay. Of course. So, um, you're the new leader of uh, Syriza for uh, just about five months. A, a party identified with the, uh, with the left. Um, when did you first become a leftist? I've been, uh, can you hear me all right, or should I be closer? Uh, I think we're okay. Hello from, uh, from me as well, and wonderful to see such great attendance. Um, Kevin, thank you for uh, hosting me. You're very welcome. Here, um, I've been on the on the progressive side of the aisle for a very, very, very long time. Um, a lot of you know that uh, I worked, volunteered for Senator Joe Biden in 2007, 2008, when he was uh, running for his party's primary. Spent six months working for him. I spent uh, one month uh, working for him in Iowa in the caucus at the time, and. Um, Joe Biden, even though in Europe he has a view as somebody who is uh, who's centrist, the reality is that in a lot of the battles in the Senate, he's been on the left. He's been on the definitely on the progressive side. For example, he was the senator who brought forth the Violence Against Women Act that a lot of people don't know about. Um, he he also had a, a a foreign policy that was strong in issues such as uh, genocide and being proactive about that the U.S. has an obligation to engage um, in, in thwarting acts of genocide. He was very vocal about Darfur while it was happening, forgotten story for a lot of us here, but that was taking place uh, in 2007, 2008, 2009. So that type of, 
um, that type of politics, which is strongly progressive uh, when it comes to all issues of human rights, uh, of uh, inclusion, of, um, of economic justice, uh, social justice, uh, I think is something that I espouse, I've always espoused. Um, I have made no, no secret of my uh, belief that we need to have open markets. And uh, I understand it's a departure from some of the rhetoric that exists in uh, the philosophy and the history of the left. Uh, but open markets does not mean unregulated markets. It does not mean, um, it does not mean uh, lack of collective bargaining rights. Okay. In which, if anything, we need to have, and Greece has completely departed from that tradition, and we'll talk more about the numbers. Yeah. Um, but another thing that, uh, that expresses me correctly, I think, or accurately, is strong national defense. Right. I, okay. not, I believe in real politic and not in, in uh, a pacifist uh, reality. Okay. Uh, we'll come on to uh, foreign policy perhaps uh, <coughs> later. But uh, you describe yourself as a progressive um, with much experience with Biden and the Democratic Party in the United States. Um, would you describe yourself as a socialist? A neo-socialist, perhaps, yes. Um, a socialist that, that understands today's uh, environment and tries to um, achieve social goals. You know, I had a, a dispute, let's say, early on in my party because I said there's no, there's no reason to demonize the word capital. And in Greece, capital with a capital C, uh, no pun intended, means uh, the... Uh, the owners of equity capital against uh, against the laborers, which I fully understand, have uh, divergent incentives in a lot of things. Um, the but then there's also capital with a lower case C, which is simply, in my view, a mathematical equation for the cost of a good and how that gets distributed in society equitably. And from that standpoint, for me, the most sacred capital is the taxpayer capital. And what we do with that. Okay. But if you're meeting progressive politicians uh, across Europe, do you say, hello, I'm Stefanos Kazalakis, I'm a socialist? I, I call myself progressive. That's, that's the adjective that describes me okay. best. You're here at the LSE with a radical history. Um, many of the students, uh, some of the staff at the LSE in the past, have thought about uh, being progressive in relation to uh, being Marxist. Uh, for people of my generation, we read things by Karl Marx and we discussed things by Karl Marx. Is that something that uh, you did in your youth? Have you, have you read writings of Karl Marx? I have read writings of Karl Marx. Uh, I've also attended the Wharton School of Finance, uh, and there's a whole different uh, yes. set of theory that they espouse over there. Um, in the end of the day, and allow me to, to say that humbly, um, th we, all, we all need to have a theoretical, a philosophical context to our policy making. There's no doubt about it. But at the end of the day, you have to inspire people to be engaged in politics, especially in a country that 52% um, of the people abstained in the last election, I believe, and to, and to explain things in layman's terms to them. The most Marxist thing I can imagine is to say that one ounce of action is worth one ton of theory. And so I am uh, all in favor of having a philosophical underpinning of what we do, but we also need to be able to articulate simple policies for social justice, for growth, for inclusion to people in a way that makes them feel part of politics. Syriza grew from 3% to 35% in 2015, not because 32% of the country studied Karl Marx. <laughs> yes. It grew from 3% to 35% because people wanted an anti-systemic exit ramp yes. from five years of austerity that led the country's coffers with a grand total of zero euro. And a third memorandum of austerity around the corner. In what ways are you anti-systemic? 
I think my whole life is anti-systemic. The way I was elected uh, to party leadership, I started a shipping company at the age of 30, raising uh, equity capital from publicly traded investor in the US, uh, when everybody in my industry, in that industry, was uh, mocking my attempt as a young guy with not from a shipping family to go out and, and to try to do that. Uh, I've, I have, uh, uh, when, when a situation took place in Greece and was 14 years old and um, my family's, uh, let's say, stability was, uh, was completely capsized by uh, an unjust situation. There was a uh, corruption ring in the Greek court system and, and uh, our life changed dramatically at the time. I decided to find an escape to the US and I got a full scholarship. I went to Phillips Academy Andover uh, and uh, that changed my life. So I've never been afraid to go into uncharted territory. Right? And then the question is, and actually, Obama, <laughs> we're talking about Biden, Obama had uh, a debate against Hillary Clinton, if you recall, that was about judgment versus experience. Mm. And on that one, I take Obama's side. I think judgment is way more important than experience. Experience can influence your judgment. But boy, do I know a lot of old people <laughs> that have terrible judgment. So there's, that is not to say anything about okay, experience. So I would guess that Obama might be more of a political hero for you than Biden. In his, in his, in his politics, yes. In his policy, I think Biden's administration is more progressive than Obama's administration. Mm. And even on the issue of uh, same-sex marriage, uh, Biden was ahead of Obama on that one. Uh, on, uh, and I will also add that uh, on the issue of uh, on, on student loan forgiveness, that's something that I feel is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, I understand the issues of moral hazard and whatnot around the issue, but at the end of the day, every fiscal policy has some type of deadweight loss. The question is, are you giving relief to people such that they will yield more into the economy, into society at the other end of this? Okay, so uh, I guess if I was an American, I'd have some understanding of uh, who Stefanos Kazalakis is. Within Greece, who would you say is the biggest political influence on you, your political hero? Yeah, I think uh, Andreas Papandreou in 1981 uh, is the model that I, I look up to. It's because that was somebody who managed to integrate the country at that time. It was after years of division and of the left being persecuted from the right. Um, and and uh, Prime Minister Papandreou was able, by the way, he flip-flopped on his EU and NATO stance. Let's not forget that. Uh, but, so I'm not espousing that. The series of history has been way more pro-European than the equivalent PASOK history, and good for Syriza for being that way all along. Um, but Andres Papandreou managed to bring some real social change, bring, um, create a welfare state, create institutions, and uh, really create a middle class in the country. And so I think that model is the model that, uh, that we need to implement now. We have 10 years of austerity uh, with a governance under Alexis Tsipras that was uh, one of the most, most um, capable governments in a very long time in Greece um, that took a country from literally zero euro in its coffers, took it to this massive cash cushion of 37 billion euro and, uh, and taking it out of the austerity measures, out of the Troika, and also, and we need to give Alexis credit for that, creating the best debt relief nego negotiation outcome in probably the history of, okay. of any type of okay. country under duress, so. But Andreas Papandreou came to power as the leader of the Pan-Hellenic Socialist Movement. And which, our, which later on bankrupted the country in part, yes. Okay, but, but, but in our conversation... New democracy way, way more than Pasok, let's be honest. Yeah. But, yeah, but in our conversation so far, you're not that comfortable. I'm not afraid to be blunt. We need to call a spade a spade and respect people's intelligence and speak truth to power. Yeah, okay, right? but, but in the conversation so far, you don't seem to be tremendously comfortable with the term socialist. I'm talking about today's terms. I mean, Andresa Pandura himself in the mid-90s had had said to people in his party how, my God, these new European leaders are a huge departure of the socialists of the 80s. 
you know, that the, the third way, the whole paradigm yes. had shifted, yes. right? And now we're at the other end of this, where we've changed from an economy of wages to an economy of dividends. And that's why people are working and working and working, and there's nothing left in the bank at the end of the month. Young people can never buy a house, the way the situation, the economy works right now. And that's why there's this type of social frustration that exists. And so um, if, if a socialist means somebody who wants societal um, equity, then yes, I'm a socialist. But what does it mean? Tell me, wh who is not a socialist by that definition? Somebody who wants only trickle-down economics? Is that somebody who is? Yes. Well, th th then, then I'm a socialist. Unfortunately, no. most governments in the UK would just be described as uh, <laughs> not uh, socialist. But well, I think they're going to get their answer soon enough. OK, OK. OK, very good. Um, just before we leave the United States, um, of course, there's been some coverage about your political career in the, and political activity in the uh, US. Uh, as you say, you have uh, you worked for Biden in the Iowa uh, states, uh, etc. Um, there were reports which you uh, vehemently uh, rejected of you being registered as a Republican voter. You were never a Republican registered voter. I have no idea how any paperwork with my name was registered in that party. I don't know if. If some person, like, you know, in the U.S., they give you some forms or an election time. And, like, I have no idea how my name got entangled in that. I have uh, never, never voted for the Republican Party. I completely despise, um, <laughs> now I'm not going to be diplomatic, I completely despise Donald Trump's administration and his style. Uh, I have uh, been with the Democratic Party since I was uh, young, in high school. I was absolutely for John Kerry and not for George W. Bush back in 2004. And, uh, and I've literally worked and donated to the Democratic Party uh, many a time. So Wikipedia, okay. please change the fact that I belong to the Republican Party. Okay. That paperwork is faulty. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. I so, think that's uh, quite definitive. Um, your phone is not on silent. My phone is not on, on, on silent. Uh, this is what we say. But preaching I, to the choir. I can tell you that someone is at my front door at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so um, not many Greek politicians have worked at Goldman Sachs. How did Goldman Sachs... Did you say government Sachs? Go uh, sorry? <laughs> uh, I, I misheard, sorry. I'm not repeating that one. Okay, okay. Uh, how did your experience at Goldman Sachs uh, influence your politics? I think it influenced my, my life trajectory more than my politics. Uh, I, I was in uh, 2008 after Joe Biden dropped out of the election, the primary. And uh, with his uh, campaign staff and Senate staff, uh, Joe had hosted an event at uh, his uh, sister's house in Pennsylvania. And this great crowd of young people was eager to see what would happen, whether Obama or Clinton would choose Biden to be Secretary of State after potentially beating McCain, and then to earn you know, a salary that is, you can't live on in an expensive city like Washington, D.C. And I thought to myself, gosh, this is like way too many factors outside my control mm. for my life to go down that path. This is 2008. I start my senior year in college, and, and uh, the economy collapses. You go leave my brothers in September, and then you have the whole string of events. And uh, actually, Obama, I think, gained massive points, both by choosing Joe Biden, as well as uh, by the temperament that he showed during the financial crisis. It was very calm and collected uh, during those motions. And then uh, we had the new government, 2009, Obama Biden. I had the option to go work in the White House. And uh, I chose to go into finance and, uh, because I wanted to have more control over my life. So uh, that was a practical decision and also to be able to gain more 
more hands-on skills about how capital markets work. So my experience at Goldman was very useful in terms of figuring out who the players are, why interest rates matter, why currencies matter, why commodities matter, what is the balance of capital between corporates and, and mutual funds and pension funds and hedge funds and uh, you know, retail investors, all that nomenclature that is very esoteric but actually important to understand. And I was at Goldman Sachs when Greece was going through its uh, first austerity package and the second austerity package. I was embarrassed for my country at the time, the fact that we were, that we had to um, go through that and you know, that we were essentially the first uh, country in the Eurozone to be a practical default. And, um, and I, felt very, uh, I felt very strongly about the, the, the young Greeks that were leaving the country. Uh, that's why I started a website uh, at the time called CV from Greece that was advising uh, young Greeks that, were, that had already left uh, on their CVs and their, uh, their cover letters so that they would have a better chance to get a job, to get into a uni in other parts of Europe or overseas. Because I thought we needed to give to our best solidarity for those people such that when the country would stabilize, they could come back with some quality experience. Okay, perhaps we could. So, but that, Kevin, is socialist doing that. Yes, okay. it is. It is. And that's socialist in action. Okay. And the thing that I learned from Goldman was that I do not want to be part of, of a business that is solely focused on capital or money, but I want to be part of a business that is focused on product. Okay. An actual product you can produce and deliver, create a brand, and not be dependent on someone else for the rest of your life, for your career. Okay. Explain to an international audience then what led you to uh, stand in the uh, election for Syriza as, as leader. I wasn't intending on uh, standing for any election within Syriza. I was in the party's uh, state ballot which is, uh, for those of you that are uh, not familiar with it, is represents 5% of seats in the Greek parliament. It's like the Senate equivalent, where, uh, where parties appoint people based on a ranked list. And so I was number nine out of 15 on Sears' list, which meant that I was solely uh, on, an honor, on an honorary spot. Um, and essentially a volunteer to support the thesis that Sears could be a good governing party for the country. Can I just ask uh, yeah. who invited you to uh, stand in that election? My predecessor. Right, okay. Yeah. So Alexis Tsipras invited me to... And then Alexis Tsipras uh, encouraged you to stand as party leader? No, he did not. Did anyone close to Alexis Tsipras encourage you to stand as party leader? No, they did not. Okay. So, uh, but he did not discourage me either. Like, so he, he was very neutral in the whole process. Uh, to his in, the sense, in the sense of being silent. Oh, and also practically, I wanted, I wanted my own merit. Yeah. You know, and it, it was very important for me to win this thing without someone else, you know, hand-holding me. It was, it's my fight to win, right? And so I don't, I don't need anybody to goad me, to, to carry me around. I'm, I'm a-okay, <laughs> the way it is. Um, but the, so I was in an honorary spot. Uh, volunteering for Syriza, uh, and uh, there was only 20 days that, that it was announced until the May election, and uh, I ran around uh, parts of, of Greece, Athens, Crete a little bit, and then we wake up on May 21st uh, to this shock, you know, that all of a sudden we thought we might have a chance, a good chance to be government, and instead we're losing by, you know, 20 points. 20 points means the country does not recognize you as a governing party. Mm. Doesn't mean what you think of yourself. Perception is reality, especially in politics. So 20 points means the country is saying you are not a governing party. Because Alexis still is very popular, always has been very popular. He has no scandals attached to his name. He's a really wonderful guy and he had a capable uh, leadership uh, overall, and so the question is, why did people not trust Syriza? 
Then we have the period between May 21st and June 25th, the repeat election. A lot of people had abandoned the process of supporting Syriza and supporting Alexis, etc. Alexis had created a 20-person committee of essentially fresh members and, and future cabinet secretaries or whatnot. That was insinuation. And I, he chose me. He chose that I be on that uh, committee. And I ran around a lot uh, with him, traveling with him, as well as uh, with uh, Admiral Postelakis, the former head of the Greek National Defense Forces. So, uh, and I, I worked hard uh, to try to bring some hope and optimism to the base that, you know, that let's bounce back to the extent that, was, that that would be possible. A month before the, May, the June 25th election, while I was traveling with Alexis, he told me, you know, Stefanos, uh, Syriza needs renewal yesterday. And there's two ways to do this. Either a new leader will, be, will emerge in Syriza, change of leadership, or massive renewal for everything underneath. Oh, what? Massive renewal right. for everything underneath. <coughs> and I told him that let's do the second thing. I'm in it. Let's, let's change everything. You know, you stay there, we'll make, we'll renew the whole thing. A few days after uh, the June 25th election, to the shock of everybody, nobody, nobody, nobody pressed him to resign. Um, people, uh, the vast majority of Syria, my, series of members, myself included, uh, wanted him to stay on as party leader. I had said that publicly, immediately on election night while I was on a TV panel, I said it on the spot that he should remain leader because I knew that we would have a chance to renew the whole party apparatus and structure. But he chose to, um, to step down in a very honorable way and to let renewal take place on its own, organically. Uh, the party should have gone down a path of having a philosophical introspection about do we want to be a governing left, a modern left, for progressive governance, for the title? Do we want to be a, or do we, do we want to be a, a pure traditional left, as we say, for there will be a protest party? You know, what, is, what, what, do, what exactly do we think on a series of issues? And then the party should have had a different conference to redo its infrastructure to get ready for the future. Hold on, none of that took place. None of that took place. The party apparatus decided to go straight to a presidential election. Hmm. And between early July and late August when I announced, for six weeks, Nobody, and I defeated four former ministers, cabinet secretaries. I, that was, I, I had zero political experience there. All four of them were former ministers of the Greek government. None of them was saying anything substantial. It was about structures and rules, internal party rules. It's like, what are you going to do? And I put a platform of ideas that was general guidelines, but also specific, such as canceling out all MP immunities and benefits, such as uh, immunity against criminal persecution, um, changing the mandatory military service, reforming that, uh, and a whole list of things, which were about open markets, but also labor rights and, and a very strong national defense. And, and, and that gained a lot of traction. And then that created a movement that I run and then I won 21 days later or so. Okay. Uh, and it, one of the distinctive things in the leadership uh, election was that you uh, were using social media a lot. It was you. What else could I use? Okay. Yeah. But um, you were talking directly to, uh, to voters, to Syriza uh, yeah. uh, voters, etc. You, you made a lot of use of uh, social media. And that was a bit different. And of course, this very weekend, uh, you've been using social media and you put out this uh, tweet or message inviting people to, um, Syriza members, to respond to some 
pretty major existential uh, questions. People in the party, some long-term members of the party, are shocked uh, and are upset that you've uh, circumvented, you've, got, you've gone round, you've ignored uh, party governance uh, structures. It's dominating the news uh, this week. Why didn't you uh, seek party approval uh, first? Did you ask, who did you ask in the party before you invited party members to vote on these pretty major questions? First of all, maybe I should remind everybody I am the president of the party. Okay. And I was elected. <laughs> and I was elected by 150,000 people who voted in the process. I have by far the, the most um, accurate and recent stamp of approval from the party base. I was elected with a clear message that I will give voice to all party members to make this a party for the members. That was my message from the very beginning. Both the party media, we have two outlets in the party, a newspaper and a radio, as well as all established national media was vehemently against me during my primary election. Zero support. All the party apparatus was against me, except some people. Yes, there were some people, but the apparatus was not. So like it, the actual... Okay, so in order to get change in the party, you feel that there has to be a, a kind of alliance between you and your party supporters out in the country against much of the established governance structures of the party? I mean, that, that is... A, it's not about the, whether myself and the structures of the party are aligned or not aligned. It's do the structures reflect what the members desire? And that's what I asked the members to opine on. And believe me, there's been um, thousands of responses in a very short amount of time mm. with a lot of very compelling content, a lot of very useful content. And in any case, a party that frankly thinks that we're going to be government and then loses with 2.3 times uh, the score between New Democracy and Syriza, the first thing that he should be doing is listening to his members. How, how can a party be afraid to listen to its members and expect to govern in the future? You're listening to your members, the people that have literally pounded the pavement, knocked on doors, handed flyers out. Let's talk to them. And, and allow me to just conclude the, the point. If Syriza's structures had worked properly, I should not be president today. There should have been a process, a bench, the fact that an outsider bypassed this whole thing, regardless of my, you know, whatever personal traits that may be, may be you know, different from, from the other candidates, there should be like an established foundation there. This party was always a party uh, with, uh, that came into power in 2015 uh, with, a, with a message to take the country out of the austerity measures, to renegotiate the, the national debt situation, it executed those goals. It brought civil unions for same-sex couples into law, for all couples into law. It, it, uh, it created the agreement with uh, North Macedonia. Okay. I take the point that you have a large base of the party last year uh, in your support. And the party has grown since, uh, okay. significantly. Okay. Why the rush? This, uh, this week, on Thursday, there's the party congress. Why didn't you wait uh, to ask the party to persuade it's a false It's a false dilemma, because the party congress is on political positions which are, um, which are articulated. I mean, everybody knows my political positions, and the, they are fully reflected in what um, the, the committee has prepared and what we're going to have. Um, my questions are, uh, is a private, it's a questionnaire to have the members' opinions for, for a long-term discussion, and we should not be afraid to ask our members anything. It's the, party, the party congress at the party convention is a completely different process okay. than, than asking the members on something that is not going to be adjudicated on in this conference. This is not a constitutional conference. Okay. Should you be afraid to make the results of the poll public? I asked 
our members' opinion. It said, the president of Syriza asks for your opinion, for your view. Whether or not I make the results public is up to me. I have no intention of making them public. Why not? Because I, I'm asking for their opinion. My, my um, recommendation is going to be based on, on the views in, the, in our party conference this coming weekend. It's going to be based on, this, on the results of this questionnaire. It's going to be based on a dialogue with party members in person, as well as in further uh, meetings and in consultation with the party apparatus, the party structures. Okay. And none of this is contradictory. That is called doing the right process. It's okay. called actually going through the hoops. Let's assume that the party poll uh, supports the positions that you're asking, and I should explain the questions being asked. You're very you. eager to find out about this party poll. Absolutely. Well, there's one or two journalists who are interested as well. Um, mm. I sense a quid pro quo over here. Um, some of the questions are, are pretty basic. Uh, you're asking whether Syriza should define itself as centre-left or left. Mm -hmm. For Syriza as a party with its uh, history, this is pretty existential. Should we change the name? Should we change the logo? Are Syriza party structures uh, effective? Let's assume that this poll uh, supports each of the, your preferred positions. Wouldn't you subsequently share that information with the Greek voters? That look, the party, uh, party supporters support me. The Secretariat, the, the Party Congress, uh, you're out of line, you're out of step with the series of supporters. So if you win, you will make it public. If you lose, you'll keep it private. No. Um, I, don't, I don't care to do something that has um, such short-termism. Um, I'm asking for their opinion, and I'm going to go through the proper structures. Um, I, may, I, I intend to disclose the results of uh, the poll to, in a private setting, with the structure members. At, at the right time, you know, after, after consulting with them. You'll share it with the political secretary. With the political secretary, absolutely. You and know, it's... And, you, and, you see and, it won't leak. I, I learned very early on in Phillips Academy, my, my boarding school, uh, a very important motto for life and for business, which says, which say, excuse me, says, no assumptions, no assumptions. <laughs> okay. And I espouse the motto to the day. Look, okay. I, it's uh, leak or no leak, the fact is people know um, when something is authentic, right? And we cannot be pretending that to, to be everything to everybody, right? What is the left? The left, above all, especially in Greece, is a way of life. It means people who, who put solidarity above personal interest, the people who fought against the right, the people who were exiled, the people who um, care about social justice, reducing inequalities, the people who go out of their way to help somebody in need, to help, to help people with no voice. Well, that is the left. It's a way of life. It's not just a book. It's a way of life. And that's why my relationship with a lot of the older generation left, um, let's say fighters and people who really um, fought for the cause, is excellent. Because they've been anti-systemic. They've literally gotten beaten up from the system physically. And they see somebody who's radical like they have been in their lives in trying to change things up in the country. So the left is about your psyche, your mind, about a way of life. When we say, as per the declaration of the party, that we cover the whole spectrum from, from the radical left to or the, gra the groundbreaking you know, left uh, to the progressive center, there's literally the word center and the word left there. Combine the two, what do you get? Center, left. Left, center, you name it whatever you want to name it. Okay. But there's no doubt that our policy program is center left, de facto. Now we are way more, um, way more in active in terms of having Keynes in economics, a government that wants to, to use its, its balance sheet to solve social issues. And I absolutely agree with that. This is a crony capitalist economy uh, that has a huge amount of nepotism, a rule of law that is, 
uh, that has been under attack, um, huge reforms that need to take place. We need the government to solve issues. The free markets are only concentrating wealth in a few families and not, not creating any type of decentralization or type of social mobility in the country. Okay. So, so from that standpoint, we are, we are absolutely a progressive party in the center-left political spectrum. Okay, so that uh, raises questions about your relationship with PASOK. The, um... One third of PASOK voted against same-sex marriage or didn't vote for it. That, you don't call that a center-left party, forgive me. That's just not, I was very direct in the very beginning when it comes to human rights, there's no asterisks, no questions, this is who we are. We're an ideologically concise, compact, cohesive party. But then, that question. Thank you. That question has come up uh, very recently, but when you returned from the US, you made a decision to join Syriza, not PASOK, but your, your heart was in a center left political formation. So why didn't you join PASOK? I mean, yeah. Alexis Tsipras himself espoused the progressive center, which, which represents me. You know, if, if, if uh, the progressive center were not part of Syriza, I probably would not be part of the party, right? I mean, that was part of the, of the issue, that there were different voices with different rhetoric um, standpoints that created confusion in the people. The people need to know, this is a governing party that understands how open markets work, that will, that will put forth collective bargaining rights, that will invest in public uh, in public universities as opposed to allow a shadow economy to take place in, in no quality private universities for the sake of creating an all-you-can-eat buffet kind of attitude about education, that will invest in public health care so that we can have actual um, quality health care, which has been completely demolished over the past 15 years. So uh, during series, in fact, <laughs> during, uh, thank you. I wish there were more of you like that. <laughs> so there's, uh, uh, over the past, uh, Syriza tried to keep it, to keep the healthcare system, uh, it, gave, it gave healthcare access to two and a half million people without healthcare insurance. Okay. So uh, that's a huge left progressive accomplishment for Syriza's government, okay. right? So uh, what, are the, what are the best chances for the center left coming to power? Wouldn't we look at the opinion polls? and think, well, if the centre-left in Greece is going to come to power, yeah. it will involve PASOK and Syriza. What kind of uh, arrangements, understanding, with PASOK might you contemplate? If PASOK wants to open up its uh, presidential election for me to run in it, I'll happily take place in it. <laughs> okay. But you, you can envisage a Look, you, we, a need, we, we need to have, no, we don't need a coalition government. We need a party that is anti-systemic, with no bank loans, able to govern the country, with all-stars, okay. with a clean party structure, with people who will give their heart and soul for this country without having gone through the political like uh, party pipeline, people who are capable of bringing back Greeks from overseas, giving meritocracy at the head of the country. Okay. Right? So, and that's what's missing in Greece. That's why so many Greeks here don't, co don't come back. Okay. So for all of those reasons, there are no circumstances in which you'd have a coalition with Basok in government. We do not need a coalition with any party. What we need is to open up Syriza to all progressive people in a, with a party structure that allows them to be equal in the party structure. This is what a party of the members means. It means you let people come up in the grassroots way. I do not believe PASOK is capable of doing that, as it is right now. And we all, by the way, we need a leader who is able to represent the country well overseas. And to be okay, uh, let's try to touch on one or two uh, policy uh, questions. You look, you look like you're flabbergasted from what you just heard. <laughs> I, I would possibly comment. Um, on one or two policy uh, questions, you've made uh, various pronouncements uh, about uh, the need to change policies. Uh, a party in your position 
would think of the need for new policies and the need to ditch some policies. Give me an example of a new policy you would like to have and an example of an old policy you'd like to get rid of. I would like to have a Marshall Plan, domestic Marshall Plan, for climate adaptation and for housing. Um, Sears actually handed over a series of maps for the anti-flooding uh, measures that need to be taken and kind of redoing the, the zoning. We have very bad infrastructure in Greece right now when it comes to handling natural disasters. Um, we saw that in Thessaly, a region that I have visited many a time, uh, where, where 500 million euro was wasted, never went to any of the anti-flooding uh, works that were supposed to have taken place. And now the country, my generation, wound up paying 2.5 billion, 3 billion euro for the damages, let alone the, the toll on human life and, and, and uh, family development and growth that the people there have had. So I think we need to have a very strong plan for climate adaptation when it comes to um, wildfires and anti-flooding. Now, like we should not be waiting for that. We need to invest in this now because my generation will pay for it in the future otherwise. And secondly, we need to have a housing investment plan uh, that creates a housing stock outside of Athens. We need to decentralize the population. There's regions of Greece that are literally rotting away. Um, that are seeing a huge outflow of the population. They're seeing industries disappear. I was in Western Macedonia a couple of weeks ago, Thessaly about a week ago. We need to create hubs where people can go there and between uh, housing incentives, the public universities, research hubs, uh, and, uh, and digital nomads, and tourism, not just beaches, but we need to have year-round tourism including in industries such as, by the way, vineyards. There's no five-star resort, give you an example, in, in uh, vineyards in Greece. We could have our own Napa Valley. Now, we don't have that. And by the way, unlike Napa Valley, we have ancient theaters to, to complement that all over the country. Other countries, the US and natural gas, we have culture. And we're not creating a year-round economy around that. Okay. In our Give me an example of a, a, a policy that you think I, is I already to be told ditched. you one. <laughs> MP immunities need to go now. Now. Like, we cannot have people being, killing people in trains and going with impunity. Somebody, there's a politician. There was a politician in charge of the control systems that were never put in place for the Tempe train crime. And no politician will get punished for this. Okay. That is despicable. That is not a country that is a modern European country. Okay. So some members of your party have said that it's absolutely critical that in the European elections in June that Syriza comes at least second. Do you agree? I think we will easily come second. I think we can shock the country. I need to execute my plan. My plan is for a grassroots movement of progressive people who want to govern the country and change, change who we have been, change the crony capitalism, change the lack of meritocracy, change a, a judicial system that has the worst uh, time of bringing cases to fruition of verdicts in Europe, actually make this country a modern European country. And uh, that's progress. That's being progressive. That's my goal. Look, I was not elected to be first in polls uh, a month after my presidency. I will beat Kiriakos Mitsotakis. We will beat Kiriakos Mitsotakis because we will create a different alternative from them. We are on the right side of history in terms of our beliefs when it comes to human rights, social justice, the environment, the rule of law, and a strong national defense, and not participate, participating in US adventures overseas with our military equipment. 
Okay. We should have our military equipment stay in Greek hands on Greek territory. I strongly believe in that. Okay. <laughs> What if in the June election, Syriza comes third? Um, and uh, if, you're looking at the, if you're looking at the opinion polls... Uh, 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 why are you asking a hypothetical that will never take place? Well, OK, but if you look at the opinion polls t today, you wouldn't immediately conclude Syriza will come first. Uh, so uh, let's think of the scenarios. Uh, w when have opinion oh, polls no, no. governed a country? OK. Well, you're asking party members in an opinion poll at the moment. They help in governing. They are instructive in their snapshot, but leadership governs a country. Okay. And so my job is to bring forth 40 people in a primary that for the first time in the country is taking place in a grassroots way from the bottom up. Okay. I am not going to be deciding who's going to be on the list of 40 people who will be representing Syriza in the upcoming European Parliament election. Our base will be deciding it. Anybody can become a candidate for European Parliament without having a clique in the president's office, without having a connection, any type of acquaintance. Okay. And that is a, is a huge innovation that, frankly, is way more important than your poll question. The fact that some, sometimes in society something changes. Okay. And for once, everybody has a chance to be in politics without having to sell himself or herself to any type of quid pro quo. What I'm coming to is... Uh evidence of success, evidence of failure. Uh, in the Greek media and in Syriza itself, you have tremendous uh, criticism uh, from uh, some quarters. Tomorrow evening in Athens, there's a conference entitled After Kazalakis, Who? I don't think that's true. Well, we could show you the evidence because it's been attended by some existing Syriza members of parliament. That was fake news. It, it, it doesn't, it, it's not going to take place. No. Okay. So there was a meeting, but thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, there, was a <laughs> uh, there was a meeting of after uh, against Mitsotakis who that took place uh, last week. Uh, that, of course, you know, when I see my name on the poster, I have to throw up, right? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, it still begs the question, though, that uh, the number of people who are uh, emphasizing it's critically important for Syriza uh, to, be, to continue to be the major party of the opposition. What, what evidence would persuade you to say, you know, this has been a mistake. I'm not, I'm not the leader for, for Syriza. No. Zero evidence. Look, the people I've met from the party base out of society are amazing people. They're disappointed from the system. I've told them many a time, I will never betray them. And that is true today, as ever before. I'm giving them the power. This is not a leader, a president-centric party. This is a member-centric party. And that is painful at times. But if we're to succeed, if we're gonna, not going to be surprised next time that we're 20 points behind when we thought we would win, I think it's time we open our eyes and ears to, to the environment around us. Okay. Final question uh, from me. Uh, Alexis Tsipras is going to speak at your party congress uh, this week. Are you anxious? No, not at all. Why would I be anxious? He's going to support your leadership. He, I want the leadership perfectly fair and square. He's the one that wanted to bring a renewal to Syriza. I'm trying to do exactly that. And I've, I, I've espoused his policies fully. So uh, you would expect him to make a speech of support for your political strategy? Absolutely. Good. OK, let's open it to uh, questions from the, uh, the audience. And I, uh, let me explain that on the screen here, there may be questions coming from the online audience <coughs> as well. Can we start with uh, the uh, gentleman here at the very end in the blue jumper? If you could just, just say who you are and then the question. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Perfect. Uh, so uh, my name is Victor. Uh, I want to ask you, you talked about your dreams of, um, of your party and how you want to transform your, your party. But uh, in the recent vote in the parliament for the gay marriage, you had, I think, two uh, MPs of your party abstaining from 
the vote. So my question is, is that part of your uh, dream party? And if not, what you are going to do? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, there was only one person who abstained for ideological reasons. Uh, the second person who abstained uh, had uh, personal uh, work reasons. He's an expat member of uh, parliament, and he was um, he had a professional conflict at the time. He had a statement on that. Um, I will I I will make my uh, announcement of my decision at the right time. Uh, I think we have waited for decades for this. Uh, bill to pass. I think we can wait a few more days uh, for uh, for that to come to fruition. But the important thing is that the lives of people are better today. We shouldn't lose the eye from the ball, right? We should keep our eye on the ball. The eye, the eye on the ball means the country is better off because Syriza made this happen. Without Syriza's votes, this would not be law today. Okay, thanks. And we have a question here. It's a microphone. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Evdoxia Limperi from MERT, the Greek public broadcaster. Uh, you said, I, I, I heard you very, um, uh, with a great interest. Um, you said you replied to Kevin's question that you, uh, when he asked you about the question, and if you asked anyone, you said that uh, you are the president of the party. Um, the, commun the party's communique yesterday reads, we are not a leadership-oriented party. Chimeras and conspiracy theories are uh, not of anyone's interest. How can you combine the two? How do you hear this? You said you are the president of the party. How do you perceive this communique there? Thank you. I I'm delighted to hear that there's no chimeras and why not, and that it's not in every, and this is not a, a, a presidential-centric party. I fully agree. It's a member-centric party. And that's exactly what I'm planning on continuing on doing. I'm planning on giving the members of the party a voice and equal access to going up in the party structure. We need, if, we don't, if we don't implement meritocracy and um, open our, our gates to the new members in the party, then how can I credibly say to the country that we're going to bring meritocracy up and down the country structure and, and economic structure? We need, to, we need to first prove that ourselves in our own house. Okay, can we take the lady here, please? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Iphigenia Mumzi. Uh, I wanted to ask a question from a different point of view about Greek politics right now, because the truth is, New Democracy won with 41%. We have three far-right parties in government. I, in my opinion, Greek society is in a, a dire situation. Uh, what are the challenges ahead for Syriza to beat this, and why is it a necessity for Syriza to win? Thank you. Thank you, Fiyenia. Um, the We do have three far-right uh, parties in parliament, um, but I think we should be optimistic. Why? Because this election and the, and, and the whole verdict of future elections is ours to lose. We lost because 600,000 Syriza voters didn't show up. They didn't go to other parties, they just didn't show up. They were disappointed by, uh, by four years of not, in my view, doing the needful to create a clear message to the country about how we intend to govern and with which people. That's why it's very important to me that we have an, a clear ideological um, con uh, cohesive message to the country. So for the, for the previous four years, Alexis Tsipras had the wrong strategy? No. That's not exactly, that's not what I said at all. Uh, they, uh, for the previous four years, there was confusion in the Greek public about, about uh, what Syriza stands for. And it's not his fault. He, he, he kept saying things the right way, right? But there was confusion. And so, um, and the policies, the, the, the election program was very clear, but don't forget, we're also dealing with a state of uh, propaganda. You see the, the rankings in terms of freedom of press and rule of law. You know, the, the media interests have been against explaining to people that, hey, these voices within Syria don't represent the government program. Just focus on a few minority voices which have, have since left the party. And so I think we have a very clear ideological compass right now about where we want to be and how we will govern. And uh, I think we need to motivate people that Syria will remain anti-systemic. 
that Syriza will, will be the party that has the power to bring this radical change that we need okay. to the country. Good, thanks. Can we take the gentleman on the second row here at the front? Thank you. Uh, my name is Andreas, Andreas Kutras. Uh, I have a, a point of order first, is that uh, Tsipras never negotiated any debt relief. It was his predecessor, Samaras, and Venizelos who negotiated the debt relief. If anything, Mr. Tsipras actually added 76 billion into the debt. And if anything else, he actually sold or hypothecated okay. I'm sure the there's Greek a question assets coming. for 100 years. But my question is the following. Syriza is not a party, it's a coalition of smaller parties that the only cohesive glue was the protest against the memorandum. What makes you think that you can turn this coalition of misfits into a political party? Um, first of all, um, thank you for the question. It's a very friendly question. Um, <laughs> There's many a Greek news outlet you could work for. Um, yeah, I, I disagree with uh, both the premise and the characterizations. And uh, I think uh, that uh, um, if there's one truth in what you said, I think it's that we need not to be a coalition, but we need to be a punch, a strong, radical punch for social justice and progress. Thank you for the question. Okay. And can we take the gentleman here at the front, please? Uh, yes, uh, Tony Barber from the Financial Times. You used the phrase in your introductory remarks a couple of times, crony capitalism. And that, this was the kind of phrase that was sometimes used to describe Greek business before the debt crisis erupted, and sometimes in connection with the idea that government and business and public administration were all sort of interlinked in rather opaque uh, networks of cooperation. Do you think then that uh, the experience of the debt crisis, and the upheaval that, that uh, society experienced through those years, in the end, not a great deal changed in the structures of the Greek economy and politics, public administration? We are at the other end of 10 plus years of austerity and two years of uh, COVID restraint, um, physical, economic restraint. Um, and I think that the, we are not yet done in the process of bringing forth the right reforms. Um, I can give you a lot of evidence of why crony capitalism exists today. Uh, the biggest of it all is the fact that there's been minimal reform in the country's judicial system. Um, it's the bane of every entrepreneur's existence. Uh, there's been minimal reform in the country's tax code. It's, uh, it changes every three months. It's convoluted in terms of different sources of income and whatnot. And, uh, and there's this absurd thing, in my view, which is the, uh, the advanced deposit or prepayment of the following year's income tax which by itself is like a self-fulfilling prophecy for tax evasion. So I want to do away with uh, this prepayment of income tax. Uh, I want to simplify the tax code so there's, there's very clear there's only one source of income uh, that's taxed at a progressive scale and, uh, and create a tax code that is stable for 10 years to bring investment in the country. Investment as part of GDP has been grossly lacking the government estimates literally half of what the government has been estimating, which, which again shows um, the, the fact that there's not enough trust from foreign investors outside of tourism and real estate uh, to invest in the country. And so I think we have a long way to go on that. Um, I am absolutely in favor of inclusive growth and open markets and bringing foreign investment in, but we also need to have uh, we need to have the right collective bargaining rights, especially with AI around the corner, artificial intelligence. We have a situation where the purchasing power of the Greek population is number 24 out of 27 in the European Union. We've had this huge wave of internal devaluation since uh, the financial crisis, since our issues. I think, it's, I think it's time that the government step in and actually reform its, uh, its internal 
um, in internal government transparency and the judicial system and the tax code and, um, and give the right incentives uh, for people to, with a public health care system, for people to take private initiative. And uh, because right now you're afraid that something bad's going to happen to you and you're going to be stuck for a very long time. How can you, how can you have small-scale entrepreneurship in a banking sector, by the way, that doesn't give credit to a lot of small entrepreneurs or startups. There's, no, there's minimal credit from banks, while the Greek banks are some of the most profitable in the whole of Eurozone, of the Eurozone. With some of the, you know, partially because they charge an ex, an ex, a, a, a huge amount of fees for transactions. I think we need to, to have some bank regulation urgently when it comes to that one as well. Just building on the... <laughs> Just building on that, if I, I may, uh, Syriza is an anti-systemic uh, party. Uh, leftists, when they look at the political economy of, of Greece, would indeed, would indeed refer to crony capitalism uh, and they'd refer to the oligarchs. So the oligarchs in Greece should be Nervous? I think the oligarchs in Greece should be nervous, yes. Very good. Um, okay. Can we go right to the very back? And uh, I think, gentlemen in the green shirts. Um, hi, my name is Panagiotis. Pan in English. <laughs> uh, I work in broadcasting industry as well. We briefly chatted to Stefano yesterday. Just a bit louder, please. Sorry, yes. My name, <laughs> my name is Panagiotis, Pan. Um, yeah, we briefly chatted yesterday. I work in broadcasting industry as well. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I was going to ask a different question, but now I'm going to ask a different question, <laughs> which is related with tax. Uh, I'm going to tell you the experience very briefly. Uh, no, no, if you could just ask us the question. The okay. question is, okay, there okay. is a big proportion of Greeks who still avoid taxes. A doctor I had the surgery 12 months ago, I paid £4,000. He declared €400 Euros out of the €4,000 uh, I paid. And believe it or not, he put the €3,600 in his socket. It's not a figure of speech, it's what has happened. And this doctor has merchandise and offices, prestige offices and houses. What are you going to do as Syriza to avoid this type of things? And I have discussed this with New Democracy members of parliament. Okay. And believe it or not, their answer was, this is how it is. <laughs> there's, uh, there's some practical issues involved in your in your question, and then there's the central, let's say, philosophical issue. I'll start with the latter. Why should a citizen respect the state when the state does not respect the citizen? It is not coincidence that Greece went bankrupt, de facto. It comes from that lack of neutral respect. Being anti-systemic and radical left, as we say, is the opportunity to fix that. It's the opportunity to, to say, we don't care what all the lobbies are saying, who gets insulted, this is what needs to be done and it's gonna be done. And to be very clear about it. And I think that's a great opportunity that we have under my leadership going forward. We need to change that. We need to change the attitude that, uh, that keeps a lot of Greeks outside the country that how the heck are you gonna come back if you're gonna essentially stoop down to that level to play the system as opposed to just living your life regularly, focusing on your family, on your success, and feeling that there's, um, there's a path to have social mobility. Okay. So there's to the practical issues. There's a question here. Hold on a second, though. Oh, sorry. On the practical issues, um, we, a big part of this comes from changing the tax code, simplifying it, making it fair, making it uh, transparent, easy, and giving incentives for people to keep receipts such that they can expense from their personal income taxes at the end of the year their medical expenses. If as a consumer you get a big deduction on your income tax because you pay 4,000 euro, then you're gonna demand that receipt. 
There are solutions here to this. Clearly, though, it's a political decision not to implement them. Okay, gentlemen here. Hi, my name is Isaac Karipidis. I'm a Greek correspondent for, I'm a correspondent for Greek media. Uh, a very simple question. If in the coming European elections, the difference between Syriza and the winning party is more than 20 points, that would be a reason for you to resign? No. Yeah, can we take the gentleman at the very front and then we're going to come to the lady just a uh, Hello, my name is Stratos Hatsouyanis. I mean, after 40 years in the UK, I just can't not make a question about what I have seen in this country and what I see now potentially as a parallel. I mean, the reason why Labour was not electable for a lot of years is because they couldn't really get close to the centre, which Tony Blair did, Kinnock didn't. What would you offer to the Greek center in order to carry them if that is a way of path for leadership? See, I think, I think we need to move away from, from theoretical discussions about the center and this and that and just go into practical policy terms. Uh, we're not a country that has the luxury of not having government intervention in our society. There's massive income disparities. There's massive geographical disparities. We need government to solve issues. There's no other way. And the issue is that nobody trusts the government. So it's like we're stuck. It's like the chicken and the egg problem. So we need to change the rule of law in the country, change the way politics is done, such that a government that is progressive can step in and actually invest, as I said, in housing and climate change and public health care and public education. And so. I don't think those issues are a matter of center or left. I think they're just a matter of common sense. If our starting point were a UK starting point, maybe the conversation will be different. But it's not. We need government to have a role after all these years of the public sector being degraded. While the UK was having primary deficits in between 2010 and 2014, there's a similar magnitude deficits, about 4.5% in both countries, Greece and the UK. The UK had growth after. We just lost all the GDP and kept going, having internal deflation. We have a completely different starting point than the UK. We need government to have a role in our country if we're going to be sustainable and resilient for the long run. Okay. Could we take the lady in the orange or the, the brown gentleman? Thank you. Hi, Stephanos. Angela Spataru. Uh, you spoke a bit about the role of AI and the complexities this might pose, uh, but there's another aspect of AI data and technology, which is as an enabler for rule of law, transparency, a better functioning economy, better access. Uh, what's your party's view on technology? We absolutely endorse technology. I'm trying to digitize my party dramatically, uh, as you may know already. I think technology can be um, an, an incredible tool, as you said, to bring about uh, transparency and, and pre even prevent crime, for example, right? You can, you can use patterns to understand that. We have to be very careful about technology governance and, and joining forces with the rest of the EU to create the right framework for the right governance that we need. Uh, but in terms of AI and uh, labor, it's a, it's a paradigm shift, what's taking place. And I think collective bargaining rights are very important, such that everybody, everybody can participate in this. We need to have a plan for that, that as, as, uh, as uh, the composition of, of uh, talent changes, not just in low-skilled jobs, in a lot of high-skilled jobs. Architects, for example, will have uh, pressure from AI. We need to have the right type of transition and, and retraining tools so that they can participate in the value added from it. And by the way, the Greek market is not 10 million people. It's 450 million people. It's the common market. Plus, we should be using AI and a high level of English knowledge and know-how in our public universities and the regional universities such that we participate in the big market with services. That's, I think, the real plan that we need to have when it comes to technology. Okay. If I could go to some of the questions coming in online. Uh, I'm going to group a few questions. Essentially, they ask for your position on Gaza and the um, right of Israel to 
defend itself against uh, terrorism. I'm summarizing here, but where do you stand on the conflict? Uh, do you condone the large number of civilian deaths in, in Gaza? Uh, alternatively, uh, shouldn't the, any left party be, quote, more supportive of Israel's right to defend itself against jihadist terrorism? Where do you stand? I think there should be an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. And... Uh, <laughs> that, that should be... If there is okay. a difference... That, that, sorry, just to clarify, that should be immediate and unconditional. It should the, be immediate. The hostages, the hostages do not need the to be... The hostages should... Hamas should absolutely return the hostages to Israel. And that's a condition of the, of the ceasefire? No, there should be an immediate ceasefire. Even if the hostages are not released? Yes, we need to have a... We need to have... Yes, we need to have a policy. We need to have... We, you cannot... You cannot be... Be killing people for the sake of, of killing people. Like, what is the exit plan here, right? What is the exit plan? There's many tools for counterterrorism that can take place, but we, could, we, cannot, we cannot be seeing hundreds and thousands of people die every week with no exit plan. That is not gonna work. That is just not gonna work. And you know what? The international community should take action. It should be more active in, uh, in taking a role here. And, uh, and if Iran has taken a big part in the Hamas October attack on Israel, Iran should be held accountable immediately. Okay. The gentleman, the very back, I'm sorry. Um, yes, uh, chap with the beard, yep. Hi, uh, my name is Michalis. So actually I was planning to ask the very question that was right before asked. And thank you very much for the response. I just want to point out that you are a major part of the international community that you just called to action. What is your plan towards the immediate and unconditional ceasefire that you just called for? I mean, specific, specifically, to anyone who is paying attention, it is becoming of growing importance among the young Greek left that the international relations of the country starts to reflect the morality of a large part of the voters' base. Are you willing to publicly and openly condemn the war crimes committed by the State of Israel right here, right now? What, what can we expect from you as the opposition leader when it comes to the ever-growing participation of the Greek state to the war crimes committed by the State of Israel? So let me say that there's things that I may think within myself and there's things that I can say publicly. So from that standpoint, I think that to the extent war crimes are taking place in Palestine, and let me re remind everybody here that it was the Syriza government that changed the term Palestinian Authority to Palestine in all Greek formal documents. <laughs> that it was the Syriza government that hosted Mahmoud Abbas for the first time that it was the series of government that brought a conversation with Cyprus and Palestine. Alexis Tsipras went there in Jerusalem and talked about Palestine. And I think it's very, very important that we take a clear ethical stance. Look, yes, I study in the US. Yes, I've lived there for a long time. It does not mean we cannot call a spade a spade. What is happening right now in Palestine is, is unconscionable. It's unconscionable. We cannot, the inter and we have two wars in our region. One in Ukraine and one in, uh, one in Gaza. And we're just seeing civilians die. You know, and and uh, I think we need to have a clear distinction between uh, counterterrorism as a strategy and, and massive civilian losses without an exit plan. Okay. That's the practical answer to your question. And allow me to just leave it at that. Could we just go one step further? Is, is Hamas a terrorist organization? Sorry? 
don't answer in a university. Don't answer in a university. Don't answer in a university of academic freedom and questions. Uh, I, 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 think, I think Hamas is an organization. I think the actions that Hamas has, ta has taken are terrorist actions. Okay, good. Let's. Um, right. Uh, I'm sorry, there's lots of questions. The gentleman just next to you here. Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Nikias. I'm a farmer in southern Greece. If you take the starting point in 1981... Where are you? I don't see you. Oh, there you are. Okay. Uh, yeah, hi. Hi, Stefanos. Hi. I'm a farmer in southern Greece. Um, what, what do you cultivate? What do you think? <laughs> well, oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> are you asking me if I'm going to be in favor of legalizing well, it? So, <laughs> They have drones, now they're using drones in the Yes, area. I am in favor. <laughs> no, no, they don't all cultivate that. A, a majority of the population do that. Um, if, you, if you look at Greece, taking 1981 as the starting point, for the last 43 years, the two-thirds of the prime ministers of Greece were US university graduates. If you look at the last 20 years, um, only Alexis Tsipras didn't study in the U.S. From that point of view, you are Stephanos. Are you happy with the record of the U.S. graduates in, Greece, in Greek politics? And do you think we should carry on voting for American university graduates as political leaders? Uh, I'm not happy with the record, and I think, it, I think what you study doesn't matter. I think what matters is what you've learned, your judgment, the fact that you have, um, you have clean hands, meaning you want to offer uh, your services to the country without entering politics poor and exiting politics rich. You know, I think that's the most important thing. It's about, it's about public service. Public service should be an honorable thing and something that people can do ideologically. And I think... Uh, uh, we could use more examples of that in Greek politics, and that's what matters ultimately. Okay, let's take just two questions. The gentleman here, oh, sorry, yes, gentleman there, and then uh, the guy at the very back in the light blue um, shirt. You, you have the, can we pass the microphone forward? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, hi, students. My name is Ikados Matsukas. First of all, I was really glad to hear the link of AI with, uh, with working rights. That's perhaps exactly what the, the neo-socialists should be talking about. It's really positive. Um, now, I get the anti-systemic uh, tone, and, uh, and uh, Alexis Tsipras was really successful in, in, uh, in, in offering that off, uh, anti-systemic off-ramp, as you, you, uh, you, um, you explained earlier, and, uh, or to link it to what... Uh, Mr. Featherstone said to, he offered the, the Greeks, he told the Greeks to, that they have nothing to lose but their chains. But it uh, felt like in uh, 2019 that message was slightly obsolete to a vast majority of Greek people. What is the, besides the anti systemic tone, what, what is the new narrative, the non nonsense, one sentence, new narrative that you will offer to Greek people? I've, I've stated my vision uh, very clearly. I want to create a path for the Greek dream. It's different than the American dream. It's a dream that within our culture that we're very proud of, we can have a pathway for people to prosper in their country without needing to emigrate, without needing to engage in street smart behavior that uh, makes them feel unethical, without needing to have an acquaintance to get a job, without needing to move within the country to, uh, to be able to survive. The, how do you do this? You do this with four pillars, in my view. The first one is with a strong foreign policy and national defense. The second is with a modern society. That entails, of course, uh, a modern system of education, but also entails um, inclus inclusion and inclusiveness when it comes to all human rights, including, by the way, on migration and refugees. The fact that we had 650 souls get uh, killed in uh, the Greek search and rescue zone last summer 
and there's no investigation internally in the country in the Coast Guard for that, I think is a sad moment for our nation. It's, um, and, and that's one disagreement I have, by the way, with the socialists in Europe. It's the Migration and Asylum Pact. The fact that we're putting a tag on having people stay in the country of, of first entry as opposed to mandating solidarity that, that refugees get equal treatment across all of the European Union. So uh, modern society, it's a matter of mentality, it's a matter of education and culture. It comes with an economy that, is, uh, uh, that brings growth and social mobility for people. Uh, this, this starts from capital markets that work uh, properly. Uh, it starts with labor. It continues on and or it combines with uh, labor rights that allow you to have savings on the side and a public health care system that lets you survive. Right, that whole infrastructure that you need to be able to, have, to experience social mobility where you are. And finally, we need a completely new state governance paradigm. We need to have uh, a state that uses technology and KPIs and not has a witch hunt with artificial type of parameters where you report to the minister for your job, that kind of, the kind of frankly disgusting relationship that exists between the public sector and the government. I give you my word, if I'm your prime minister, I will never influence a public sector, ever, ever. We need to change this paradigm. I enter hospitals and people are afraid to talk to me because they're afraid that if they see me talk to somebody, you don't believe me over there, but that's okay, I can see you. <laughs> but, um, well, I, I believe you, I just think that we need a lot of work. <laughs> well, then come help me. Um, and, and so I think we need to have a, a completely new uh, and, and very transparent uh, form of governance across the public sector. It includes policing, community policing, and having the right transparency there too. Um, we need to have a, a uh, natural disaster response that is separate from the, uh, from the military. Like we cannot count on our, mil on our armed forces to intervene at all times. We need to have a national emergency response service that works properly. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the judicial system, the state of law, like the ability to, to feel like the Greek court system is your last resort, right? And which is not that what Greeks feel right now. Okay, great. So it's the final question with the, our friend up here. Hello, Stefania. This is Dimitris. Thanks for the talk, the discussion. Always uh, being proactive on the discussion. Uh, my question is about, you mentioned during your talk, no arms out of Greece. While in the meantime, Denmark, Denmark is giving all their artillery in Ukraine. Considering that we have, for example, Russian missile systems, that we know the missiles and the guns will expire, right? Do you still believe that we should not get rid of out, get rid of them, and replace them by other systems? And how should and this is very effective on the on playing a significant geopolitical role in the upcoming years? Yeah. So. Uh I don't view that as, as, a, as a real dilemma. I think we should absolutely have equipment in our, in our, in our territory. Uh, we do have an issue with the um, equipment uh, re replacement, uh, given the sanctions on Russia. That's an issue that has nothing to do with, with handing over uh, equipment in general. It's a technical matter. I think the issue is uh, we, we sent passenger, we sent uh, Humvees from the islands uh, for for transport up to up to Ukraine, and uh, in general, I think our country should be focusing on on its own defense. Um, and I think that uh, the uh, the example of sending the naval vessel outside before the EU engage in operation, this is speedless operation in the region, sending it as part of a, um, a, a U.S. operation is not the paradigm that I want to follow. I want to follow a paradigm that that. Um, abides by NATO defense and by EU 
uh, and by EU defense planning and EU operations up to that point. Okay, um, we've come, uh, I think, uh, to the end of this uh, event. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to join me in thanking uh, Stefanos Kazalakis. Can I just say, though, that uh, for, what, just over 90 minutes, uh, he's been willing to answer questions on almost anything, uh, and that's uh, highly, uh, we appreciate that very much uh, indeed. Uh, we agreed uh, the nature of the conversation before coming uh, here this evening, and he's kept to that. Uh, he's been very willing. He's been very willing to answer questions on a whole host of uh, um, issues. Uh, so uh, we thank you for that. As a token of our appreciation, there's a bag next to your chair. Just. Uh, but I have a watch there. I no, see. no, this is mine. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody socialist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, could you, uh, you just call socialist thieves? <laughs> no, 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 no. But there's also something in the back as well. Okay, let's open this first. Okay. I note that it's in red. Much appreciated. Or fuchsia, whatever this is. <laughs> Burgundy. <laughs> Very well packed. Yes. Somebody tells me it's an LSC pen. Let me see. Waterman Paris. Let's see. Open it. Okay. And it is? An LSC pen. An LSC pen. There you go. Also in the bag, if you want to, uh, if you want to look in the bag as well. There's, there's more. The hat. Uh, the hat. So, of course. Uh, given your uh, American background, we thought <laughs> this would be a, a perfect uh, thing. So, as we finish, can I just mention that uh, you're all invited to continue the conversation with a reception immediately outside uh, the theatre up here for uh, wine and, uh, and drinks. Uh, when you enjoy the wine, please appreciate this is uh, an LSE uh, reception uh, and don't necessarily judge the quality of the wine. Uh, <laughs> uh, Who, who's being a socialist now? <laughs> OK, OK. Uh, if you could remain in your seats, we'll vacate and then we'll join you uh, outside but the theatre. You should know from my socialist policy, I want all Greeks to be enjoying Chateau Margaux or whatever you okay. want. <laughs> please, thank you. <laughs>